Good day everyone. Uh, yesterday we had uh, a trailer for the Warhammer Total War 3 game. This introduced a brand new faction, or a very old faction that's been brought into the present day. So a lot of people don't know about this faction, and it really hasn't been talked about much since 2nd edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. So today we're going to talk about the Grand Empire of Cathay, or the Celestial Kingdom. When we talk about Cathay, we have to go right back to 1st and 2nd editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. This game was a little different then, it was more inspired by historical war games than actual fantasy games. Although it was fantasy based, a lot was still stuck in that historical period of gameplay and with miniature war games. Warhammer was really the first one to really take off in such a big way. But saying that, it was still stuck in this weird period of time where you had gods of law, where you had nations beyond the old world that were heavily inspired by real nations of Earth. Cathay was one of these nations. So there were little bits of law out there, such as the Celestial Dragon Empire and the Emperor, which had a dragon leading them. Now, in the trailer, we've had um, a couple of new characters introduced such as the Moon Empress and a few other bits and pieces but I'll come to those a bit later in other videos because we really don't know much about them the two new characters which are the son and daughter of the Moon Empress and the Celestial Dragon Empress respectively were new creations by GW and people at Total War so going from that what do we know from 2nd edition to 9th edition in Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Who are the Cathayans? What do they do? And um, what's the Empire like? Again, we're stuck in a sort of period of time that's heavily influenced by the real world. There is a Great Barrier. Although this Great Barrier is depicted as being sort of a floating barrier and magical in nature, it was more physical in previous editions. It was basically the Great Wall of China, just bunged or planted into the fantasy world of Warhammer. The Emperor building this wall tried to brace chaos, tried to stop chaos from invading his country, his nation. So let's look at some timeline first before we go into a few things. We look at the very first Imperial calendar because the timeline in Warhammer Fantasy Battle is always done from the viewpoint of the Empire. A lot like the 40k one is always done as a timeline from the Imperium. 2570 minus. Titanic warps down Midrite and plummets into the Ogre tribes. This was done because the Celestial Dragon Emperor was sick of children being taken by the Ogre people and the Ogres in the Mountains of Morn. So he decided to flatten them with a giant Warpstone Midrite. However, this did turn into the Great Moor and probably caused a lot more problems in the long run rather than trying to stem the Ogre population. In 1800 minus, the Dragon Emperor unites what is to become Cathay. He creates the Great Bastion, or the Great Wall, an impenetrable fortress wall. Again, this has been turned into a more magical thing in, in, in Total War Warhammer 3 and the trailer that we've got. Now, I'm not 100% sure what parts of that trailer I can use. Um, and what I can go through. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take some stills that they've put out there themselves and I'm going to put them on the screen. Saying that, we only ever had maps before of the Warhammer world and it does present the Great Wall or the Great Barrier as a physical structure rather than a magical and a physical one. Of course we were limited by maps and such things at the time but I just wanted to point out the two big differences that are noticeable straight away with that trailer and previous editions. Minus 166, the Dwarves fall, the Empire of the Dwarves fall, and their holds are forever shattered. Now, um, going from that, you go to minus 1450 to 1400 when the Skaven turn up, minus 1200 when the cult of Qian Chi or Zench appears in the Carthayan Empire and starts to be a major threat. I want to say a few things going from now it is a bit strange that we have information regarding certain dates of the Cathay but yet we know very little about the Empire itself we know almost nothing about how the structure of the Empire works 
the you know um, the strata um, how it is day to day compared to the old world where we have masses of information on Britonia, the Elven Kingdoms, the Empire, even the Ogres are given more lore and more in depth knowledge than Cathay and Nippon and the Kush and the various other kingdoms in the Warhammer world. Minus 87 is basically when the Dark Elves start raiding Cathay. However, the Emperor has enough of this after a couple of year, hundred years and creates a typhoon to sink the Black Ark of the Talon of Agony. Lan Kirth Belhart starts raiding Nippon and Cathay after this. After a hundred or so years of this, Cathay mounts a massive armada and tries to keep um, Felhart at bay with mixed results. Then we get the Tulean explorer Marco Polo or Marco Pole as it is in Warhammer. They just stole names from historical fiction at this period of time and they continue to do this right up until the end of ninth. Whether that's good or that's bad, that's up to you. Minus 1330. Earthquakes hit. Minus 1310 in the Imperial calendar is when a serious earthquakes hit the Great Bastion and make it fall. Chaos Warriors surge through the wall and Demon Princes and the Cathayans start their defence of Cathay in a way that the Old World could never represent. When the Old World defends against Chaos, they are more trying to fight a battle against invaders, but when Cathay fights wars against Chaos, they use a lot of different tactics. They use the barrier to keep them by, which is a defensive tactic. However, they use a lot of strike forces, which Kislev and the various human kingdoms tend to not do. They tend to react rather more slowly than the Cathayan Empire. The Cathayan Empire is a lot more retroactive, I mean, a lot more proactive, I mean. And um, because of the different strata of troops that are found within the Empire, such as... Um, I'm going to take some examples from various books such as the Dogs of War book and a few other p bits and pieces that were published in White Dwarf. These were dragon monks, these were monkey soldiers, these were various animated statues, these were dragon kin. They were lots and lots of fluffy pieces of information out there which were basically a sentence or two long that built up Cathay um, and probably gave the folks at Warhammer Total War and the design team a lot to go on which is great because we'll have a fully fledged army rather than just bits and pieces over various editions which you'd have to piece together yourself which is cool then we go to 1690 emperor wu launches a great invasion to conquer the southlands but it's destroyed by the lizard men because they don't want no crazy people invading their homelands the the Cathayan yin tuan makes an epic journey across Lustria and the Southland. He narrowly escapes sacrifice in Zaklan and he is the only survivor of a whole expedition. This goes back down to a another piece of his historical fiction or fact, depending on how you look at it, about a great fleet that was dispatched from China and supposedly made landfall in South America. There are mixed results on whether this is true and whether this did happen. However, there are some relics from some Chinese vessels that were found in parts of Australia, I believe, and New Zealand. So it is possible that they did explore other lands quite far away, but we're not 100% if they actually did make it to South America. I just wanted to add that piece of historical lore or, um, or fiction out there or fact, whatever you would want to call it. I'm not sure. What it might, maybe folklore? Because there are, of course, we've only got the results of a memoir from the supposed captain of that expedition, and there you go. It, it really depends on whether you believe it or not. A lot like the lore in Warhammer itself. Then we get 1699, which is Ricaro and Rabio, trek along the Silk Road, and establishes a trade agreement between the Old World and the Cathayan Empire. Wu. The Monkey King becomes Emperor in 2377. He installs a Skaven advisor by the name of Kishik and it became and Cathay comes under the control of the Skaven basically at that period of time until 2509 
Turkman, the Maggot Lord, marches south along the mountains of Morn to recruit followers, and then he starts to invade the Border Princes. His Lieutenant, Sal the Faithless, attacks the Tower of Ashia, and is defeated by another Dragon Emperor. Now, we don't know when the Monkey King is removed from power, but it, we know it's before 2509, so there is about 200 years of rule by this Monkey King and the Skaven in Cathay. Which is kind of interesting in itself. It seems that the Skaven were able to pull a lot more shenanigans with political power in the East than they were in the West. I'm not sure what. What though, because we have, again, very limited information. Right, so what do we know from Second Act up to Ninth? We know that they're the largest empire and the empire that has the most wide rangest of populace, which means they have different types of clans and peoples, a lot more than the Empire of Man under Karl Franz does, and a lot more than Britonia and various other kingdoms do. Two, we know that the Great Mages and Alchemists play a key part in their defence, whether it's the Great War, whether it's their mainstay of armies, and whether it's the general day-to-day -day business of the Empire. Three, we know that they can manipulate comets and astromancy, Maybe on par with some elves. I'm not saying all the elves, but maybe on par with some of them. If the Emperor was able to call down a meteorite the size of the Great Moor to stop the ogres from taking his people, or their people, we can say that the Emperor, or the Dragon Emperor and his astromancers have a great deal of magical influence and power. And we don't know if they were taught by the elves like the kingdoms of the Old World were. Just, just a couple of thoughts. As time goes on and we have more information about the Cathayans in Warhammer Total War 3, I will be doing a lot more lore videos. I will be looking at the son and daughter of the Moon Empress and the Grand Celestial Dragon Emperor. But for now, we're just going to talk about two more things and then the video is going to be wrapped up. The first thing I want to talk about is Hobgobbler Khan. This is a Hobgoblin kingdom or empire massive in scale. To say that he or the Hobgobler Khan's troops are massive is an understatement. When individuals were travelling on the Silk Road in the Warhammer world, it said that his troops would be from horizon to horizon, day to night, whether they were doing some sort of like backward thing where they would make their numbers seem larger by basically going in a circle. Is not exactly known, but we know that they do have masses of manpower, or hobgoblin power, who ride lots of wolves. The second thing is, we know that the Cathayans really don't like the ogres, and tolerate them as mercenaries occasionally, considering their past taking of their children and various citizenry, to eat, mind you. It got to a point where I've... I've I've said a couple of times, the Dragon Emperor was forced to be proactive in this situation. A lot more than the um, other Emperors were since and before. What made him do it, we don't know. Um, what would stop them from happening again, again we don't know. But he did create a massive area that was basically a wasteland filled with warpstone that mutates and causes a lot of dangers to both the Cathay and the Yogas themselves. So, it put a barrier between these two forces. I just want to talk about one final thing that probably won't come up, but I wanted to talk about it anyway. Occasionally you'll see models armed with the Cathayan Longsword. This is basically an ogre weapon that appeared a couple of times in 8th and 9th edition in the man eaters and you could give it to some characters I believe as well. That was basically a katana. And it was a lot, it basically was just like a semi-magic weapon that gave you plus one to hit or plus one strength or something like that. But it was a very decent weapon or it labelled you to strike first. It basically had one of those rules, uh, I don't remember offhand. But it's not really important. What is important is that the long swords that the Cathayans have were of better quality than standard humans in the old world. And it goes right back. So if they have like slightly magical weapons on their base troops, I could see that because there is a historical or a, yeah, a precedence within that in the Warhammer Fantasy lore. Saying all those things, we do not know if 
the other kingdoms will make a an appearance in Warhammer Total War 3. And that's a bit of a, it's also shame, but it's also not unexpected because they do have things to work from for Cathay and Kislev. There are some articles saying that they, there was nothing before, but there were bits and pieces in the Dogs of War rule books and in White Dwarf and from 2nd edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. So they're not working from zero. I do like some of the troops designs that we've got in the, pre the previews from the trailer and the steel images that they've released. Well, GW over on the website and a few other places. Like there's battle balloons, there's like statues, there's human troops, there's even a sort of like Jazil team that very similar to the Skaven, so maybe that's where they got the idea from. The Skaven ripped off Cathayan weapons. I wouldn't be surprised to be honest because the Skaven are like that. They will just take anything from anywhere and use it. Also, the Empire does take cues from them with the Hellstorm rocket battery was inspired by fireworks taken from an ambassador to Cathay and it almost caused a lot, a lot of damage in the city and um, they developed the Hellstorm rocket battery because of it. So there we go, that's all the information that we have about Cathay. There are a little bits about cities here and there but those are probably subject to change when Total War hits. I will note that we do know some names of some cities that I will just I will just put out there before I wrap up. We called Weijin, which is the great city in the eastern side of the Great Bastion. It's basically filled with a load of Skaven underneath, which which city isn't at the moment. It is the seat and the capital of the Dragon Emperor and the Celestial Empire. Bichai, this city is um, under the sway of Zench quite often and the cult of Qian Qi or Zench uh, started around 1200 as they've already previously said. We don't know if it's still allowed or if it's still around in the game. It might come into play that it's one of the key battlegrounds for Cathay. Fu Chao is only known for its tattoo parlours. That's all we have on it because one of the characters, Yin Tuan, uh, had an imperial dragon tattooed on his back there. Fu Hyung is the home of the chanting monks. Krith Illyrian is the palace of a thousand bodily delights. It's encircled by dark elves and witch elves when the armies of the dragon emperor arrived. The dark elves had already returned to the sea. In their wake they'd left a town of corpses and death. So it's possibly it was home to some sort of weird bizarre blood cult which attracted the witch elves and the dark elves and they basically sacrificed most of the population. Mount Lee, a monastery, again it's possibly this is where one of the stone statue mercenary units came from that was mentioned in a white dwarf or the Dogs of War book. Shangyang, the westernmost Cathayan city. This is where Rikoro and Robio appeared and established a caravan post. The Tower of Ashira, a watchtower in the far Cathay amid the stone lands and it's basically part magic, part stone, so like the Great Barrier is now. It's probably where they got their idea from and it holds in the sky, keeping an eye on the ogres, basically. That's what it's made for. It also was assaulted by Sathal the Faithless, a Tazanite sorcerer. Nan Guao, nothing is known, but it's on the western side of the Great Bastion. And Heiyang, a city that was destroyed by Archeon to become overchosen. So that's all the possible cities and the bits that we know about them. We've looked at the We've looked at the overview of the Empire itself, the Celestial Dragon Emperor, we don't know who it is at the moment, but we do know that there is a Moon Empress and they've had two children who are going to be the key players in Warhammer Total War, three of the Cathayan faction, they are the two legendary lords. I'd like to thank you all for watching this video, do take care of yourselves, please like and subscribe, 
and bye-bye.